If you have a copy of the scriptures, I invite you to turn to the Song of Songs, sometimes called the Song of Solomon. The Song of Songs, chapter 4. We will read the whole chapter. We're going to focus on the first 10 verses, but we'll read the whole chapter. So Song of Songs, chapter 4. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins, and not one among them has lost its young. Your lips are like a scarlet thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David built in rows of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that graze among the lilies. Until the day breathes and the shadows flee, I will go away to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Depart from the peak of Amana, from the peak of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. You have captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. You've captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. Your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A spring locked, a fountain sealed. Your shoots or an orchard of pomegranates with all choicest fruits, henna with nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all choice spices, a garden fountain, a well of living water, and flowing streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind, blow upon my garden, let its spices flow. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. Oh man, you guys are in trouble if I'm crying while we read this. <laughs> uh, it has worked its way into my heart. And so, uh, this this. Actually, could somebody get me? I didn't think I was going to get this sloppy. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. The title of the sermon today might, I don't know, surprise you. He likes me. He likes you. He really, he really likes you. We've been reading or, or hearing through the book of Amos, right? And we've been rightly hearing about God's righteous judgments, about his displeasure with his people at times, with their sin and his, his declaration to come in judgment. And it is good for us to hear that. It is good for us to, to hear the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, the requirements and the standards of God which are good for us, and of his displeasure and his anger towards sin so that we wouldn't take it lightly, so that we would flee from that which is displeasing to him and harmful for us. And we hear of, his, of even his wrath, but it's his protective wrath. 
He protects his own holiness. He protects his purity. And he protects those who are harmed by sin. And so the Lord doesn't take sin lightly. And while we should rightly hear that and fear that, at the same time, we also, there's, there's a goodness even in the wrath of God, a protective justice. But we also recognize if we hear that over and over and over, it, it can become a little bit weary. Not that we should have itching ears to hear soft, calm words all the time, but we don't want the people of God to become weary and well-doing. And so, um, you know, we talked as a session, and, and when times when Pastor Stan was out, we thought it'd be good to hear of uh, passages that might highlight the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. Not that, that uh, all Scripture is God-breathed, right? All Scripture is profitable for us. Some portions are a little bit harder to hear than others. That is true of the prophets. And so we want to come, and, and, and it was uh, my task to do this, the one that, was, uh, that might make you, that made me cry. <laughs> and so we come to the, the song of songs, and in it we hear of the love of God for his people. And it's one thing to hear that God loves you, that he is for you, okay? That he's committed to you, that he has given himself, that he's oathed to you, that he's made promises to you, and he's carried out those promises and demonstrated his love. It's another thing, at least I don't know for me, it's another thing to know that in Christ, he likes me, that he delights in you, that he wants to be with us corporately, as a body, but that he's also attached to you, drawn to you, even as an individual, and that he wants us to delight in him. Sometimes love can seem like it is commitment only, or, or that faithfulness can have certain aspects of it that, you know, hey, we just, we know that we ought to do the right thing. And sometimes I think we can conceive of God as, yeah, I mean, I know he loves me, right? Like, he's, he's going to do what is right. He's going to keep his promises. I know that the, in my head that God loves his people. But I'd be a liar if I didn't say that there's, there are times where I think, I mean, he loves me in a long-suffering, like, he kind of, he tolerates me. Amen. He's, I mean, he's, he's committed to me, but I don't really know if he likes me, right. if he wants me around. And now this is not the, the most important necessary aspect of God's love, but I know that we've, we've mentioned Jane Austen before. What was that? <laughs> Austen, uh, Jane Austen. I do think that she highlighted something in a few of her books that was a keen insight about love. She talked about wanting, or, or her characters speak of wanting a union that was not devoid of affection. That to be united to someone for the rest of your life that was only committed to you, but that didn't really feel anything towards you, was also some, a, a miserable type of existence. I mean, there's benefits to it, but it's so far beneath what ought to be, what is possible. And when I consider or think of our union with, with God, our relationship with God, that we're going to be dwell with him for eternity, there's a, a wonderful aspect of it. But at the same time, if we consider that if God were merely committed to us, we might be united to a God who didn't much care for us or didn't delight in us, a union that we thought, I don't know, he, I'm going to be merely tolerated forever. That's terrible. That does not sound like the bliss of heaven or the life to come. Well, praise be to God that that is not the case at all. And so sometimes I think of, you know, of, of love and I think, you know, it hits me a little bit deeper to hear like, I'm in light with you. I enjoy you. I delight in you. I want to be around you. 
I want to be attached to you. And I think that this is what we hear clearly in the Song of Songs in chapter 4. Now, the Song of Songs, as you can tell, is a, is a series of poems. It's a romantic or, or, or a, a series of poems celebrating marital love. Chapters 1 through 3 before marriage, chapter 5 to the end after the, the wedding night. And what we have here in chapter 4 is, is the, the wedding night. The, the consummation of the marriage between the bride and the groom. And so I do want to be careful as well. As I was preparing this sermon, I really did think, what have you done, Ben? <laughs> We're a week out now. It's too late to change, <laughs> to change this text. Right? But I do want to be careful for multiple reasons. One, the subject matter that is dealt here is one of, of intimacy of love. And at the same time, the subject matter is, is discreetly handled, right? It's given to us in metaphor and, and imagery. And at the same time, the Song of Songs is not ashamed to speak about marital love, to speak about physical union between a man and a woman. It's not embarrassed to. In fact, the Song of Songs helps us, actually, to, be, to openly celebrate it, to celebrate or, or to be glad for it and yet to be discreet with it. There's no need to be embarrassed about the fact that a man and a woman love one another and come together. And yet there's also no need, absolutely forbidden, to be crass about it or joke about it or, th or, or, or speak about it in terms that would lower the beauty and the significance of it. And so it's a, there's a need to be clear and direct, to not be embarrassed about it, and at the same time to be honorable, to be discreet. The book of Hebrews tells us that marriage is, marriage is honorable and the marriage bed is pure. Right? Um, marital union is a, it's a private act that's got public evidence. And so on the one hand, we can speak about we need to be discreet and, and careful about speaking about a private act, a beautiful private act. And yet there's public evidence of the fact that people have come together. In Crown and Joy, there's lots of public evidences <laughs> that a man and a woman have loved one another. The scriptures are not embarrassed about that. We don't either. I think we as a church and in the culture in which we live in, we need, to be, we need to learn to have a healthy, unashamed, happy attitude about the great gift that God has given us and at the same time hold it, be, be discreet, be respectful about this beautiful gift that the Lord has given us. All right, so that's my, that's my, my caveat or, or the, the thing to be, to be careful about as we dive into this passage here. So while the immediate context of our passage today is, is the romantic love between a man and a woman, between a bride and a groom, there's also a, another way that, that the Song of Songs has is, is been understood through church history. Uh, and, and a few different interpretive uh, uh, guides for us. And I'm, I'm, I don't want to delve too, too deeply into it, but uh, there's there's a, both a Jewish and a Christian tradition that sees this is in an allegorical form. This is, this is primarily about the relationship between God and his people, or for in, in, in Christian theology, between Christ and his church. And so there's a, a way of looking at it that we'll find like kind of one-to-one correlation. So even in our passage, I've heard sermons recently about the doves of her eyes are, are, are the Holy Spirit. Or... or um, you know, the, the lips are, are uh, the, the pure speech that we ought to have. And so while there's some benefit, I think, to this allegorical way of understanding Song of Songs, I, I think a, a healthier way or maybe a more accurate way, and you're open to disagree, is what we would call an, an analogical understanding of it. That the marriage between a man and a woman is an analogy between Christ and his church. That the, that the foundational relationship 
The foundational, the prototype marriage is Christ's union with his bride. And that all other marriages, all other unions between man and woman in the bond of, of matrimony is reflective of or, or is based upon the fact that Christ is united to his church. And so one, think about what a generous God he is. That God would give us the institution of marriage, it's temporary. There is no marriage in heaven. We will be like the angels. They're not married or given in marriage. So God has given us a gift that helps us to better understand how he, how Christ is united to his own people. And within this marriage between man and woman, share a love that could produce beautiful poetry like the Song of Songs. And that this is a, a, a generous gift that God has given to his people. But because the marriage between Christ and his church is that foundational, prototypical marriage, we can find that statements in scripture that are true and beautiful and, and shared between a man and a woman if, if true, if accurate, if, if pleasing to God, then we can say these are also then the sentiments of Jesus Christ towards his bride. We find in Song of Songs how Jesus feels towards his church. How Jesus Christ feels about you, about me, and how we ought to reciprocate and feel towards him. And I don't know if you could tell from chapter 4, but this is not mere commitment, is it? <laughs> I think Jesus likes his bride. I think he's attracted to her. He's drawn to her. So let's, let's dive in and consider some of what is said about the bride of Christ. Or, or some of the, the things that the groom says about his bride. Now, we don't know exactly who this groom is or who the bride is. The, the, the book is attributed to Solomon, and his name is mentioned in chapter 1 and chapter 3 and chapter 8, but pretty clear that it's not necessarily Solomon who is the bride, uh, who is the groom. Well, we know he's not the bride. Who's not the groom? And uh, we're not entirely sure who, who the, the, the bride is either. She could, some think that she might be, uh, 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 this might be a, a royal wedding between, you know, to, between two nations or, or at least a nobility within Israel. There's some indication in chapter one that this actually, and I'm convinced of this, that, that, that she's not noble per se. She speaks about her, her dark skin because she's been working in the fields. And, or working in, in among, the, uh, among lambs and that her brothers are, and her family members are kind of harass her for uh, tending to the sheep but not tending to her, her, herself, that her vineyard has been untended to. And so we've got some indication that maybe she's not of noble class. And yet, in chapter one, she's, she's very confident though. I tell you what, man, this, the, 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 the bride of, the Song of Songs is, is, she said, hey, don't look down on me because of my dark skin. I am lovely. So I want to tell my, 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 my black and brown sisters, my chocolate wife, I, uh, you are lovely. You are lovely. And none, none should look down on you for your, your dark skin. But all of us should find these expressions of beauty encouraging. And so the groom is speaking to his bride again on, in chapter three. The wedding, the the the, the train, the, the the procession was coming, and so here we have the after after the the ceremony itself. And so he says to his bride, "Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead." And then, as we read before, he comments on more aspects of her physical beauty. Now, we might read some of these, <laughs> some of these uh, descriptions and not necessarily find them like, oh, that's uh, so romantic. My hair is like a flock of goats. <laughs> or your teeth are like sheep that have just been shorn and washed, right? But in this day, these, these are expressions of, of attraction. He's telling her, your eyes are, are, are this clear white, 
piercing white, beautiful and pure like a dove. Your, your hair is dark and lovely, flowing down like, like goats coming down a mountain, but like from the top of your head flowing down your neck. Your, your hair is dark and beautiful. Even complimenting her teeth, that her teeth are like a, floor, uh, like a, uh, like a flock of shorn ewes. Your teeth are pearly white. Right? And these, uh, these lands, all of which bear twins, not one of them is, you don't have any missing teeth. Now that might not seem significant, but uh, folks, dental hygiene has advanced quite a bit over the millennia. And so to compliment your beloved saying, your teeth are beautiful white and, and, and you've got all of them. That, that is a high compliment. Or in our day, we could see it as saying this, I love your smile. I love to see your smile is what, is what the, bride, the groom is saying to his bride. He compliments her lips being scarlet, this beautiful color. He, he, he compliments her cheeks, halves of a pomegranate. What? She's blushing. He's gazing upon his love with love and desire. And she's looking back at him and her cheeks are, are flushed. She's enthralled with, he loves me. And I love him. And then he compliments her neck like the Tower of David. Right? She's and again, I know, oh, I forgot, kids, ask me, I do have a picture, and I know you've got a bullet in there, I want to, like, if you can, maybe draw some of the, uh, the funny, uh, well, what well, might be funny, but I, I've got some artwork I want to show you that I think you would find uh, interesting, all right, kids? But he compliments, again, her, her strong neck, right, and, and describes it as a tower, it's a, it's a buttress, it's a support, it's a place of safety. So he finds in her shelter, he finds in her strength, She's got a, maybe, a, maybe she is not of high noble st uh, state in her, in her position, but she's got a, a stately neck. She holds her hot head up high. She's not ashamed. And there is strength and safety to be found in his beloved. And he even compliments her breasts. He says, your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. And... I think the, 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 the groom here is eager to follow Solomon's wisdom in Proverbs chapter 5. Look it up later if you want, okay? Where we're encouraged, be intoxicated. Be intoxicated with the love of your youth. Be intoxicated with your bride. And he says, until the day breeds, until the morning, we are going to be together celebrating, enjoying love together. Because I love to be with my bride. And she loves to be with me. And he sums up all of these accolades, all of these descriptions, all of this affection and admiration in verse 7 where he says to her, You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. So the groom goes through parts of her body, complimenting them, admiring them, speaking of, of how much he's attracted to different parts of the body. And he doesn't name every single part of her body, but he mentions numerous parts of her body and then sums up the whole thing by saying, you are altogether lovely. The, whole, the, the summation of my attraction to you is this. I find no flaw in you. You are beautiful. So again, I said if we're, we're considering this, uh, this analogical, right, the analogy, uh, this analogical understanding of this book, and that this is of Christ, ultimately is speaking of the reality and the truth of Christ and his bride. Does Jesus look at his bride's body parts and compliment them? Or speak of them in this attractive, affectionate way? Yes, he does. If you've got the scriptures, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 
Is there not another portion of the scriptures where we hear not only of the bride of Christ, but the body of Christ, and not just the body as a whole unit, but even the body in its individual components? There is, is there not? The apostle tells us, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And then the apostle goes on to say, if, if this part of the body says to that part of the body, or if this part of the body says to that part. So the Lord Jesus doesn't just have a love for the body of Christ as, this, as a corporate entity. He certainly does. He certainly does. He is, he, from heaven he came and sought her, right? As we'll be seeing in the church is one foundation, and that's a true reflection. But we also have this description that, that Paul is, wants to be very careful to say that, that when we consider the body of Christ, there, it is one body, but it's also made up of many members, the Lord Jesus is very well aware that the, his body, his bride is one body, but also has parts of her body. And if we have in the Song of Songs, his, his attraction to, his attention to detail, his clear articulation of affection for different parts of the body, then saints, he also has his eye on, on specific parts of his church. He doesn't look at us, crown and joy, as just this blob of humanity and say, oh, I'm, I'm so attracted to you corporately, but you individually, I don't really care much for you or for you or for you. No. And, and Paul lists the, the foot, the eye, the ear, and even talks about the, the, those parts of us that are less honorable being covered up shown more honor. So even if, even if a part of the body, the part that expels waste from the body, not necessarily attractive, even that part Jesus looks at. And that might be the, the prophetic part. I don't know, I tend to think of maybe the, the lower intestine is like the prophetic part. Right? Calling out that which is, should not be and, and, and getting rid of it. And the world often, and sometimes the church often, looks at that function of the body and says, no thank you, we don't want it here. We don't want to hear the stuff that needs to get, be gotten rid of. Right? And so doesn't the world and the church sometimes treat that function of the body dishonorably sometimes? Jesus has his eye on that. Jesus expresses how lovely. In the whole body, all the part, there is no flaw. My bride, you are all together lovely. Not just together as one body, but even you, individual parts. So much so that he's also poured out his Holy Spirit and gifted each part of the body. So the gifts that Jesus gives are not just gifts for the whole thing together, although they are, they are also individual gifts that we might function and live and work together. Jesus loves his body together and you individually. He delights in you. He cherishes you. Jesus doesn't merely tolerate you. He's not here to remind you for eternity that you're not worthy of him. That, oh, in, your, in real estate, you're, you're dirty. No. He looks at his bride and says, there, there is no flaw in you. Not a single flaw. You are all together lovely to me. Oh, my goodness. I don't know, if you're like me, then sometimes you might tend to think, is this possible? Is it true? Doubts creep in at times. But I've done this, but I'm this person. I have this weakness. How could you look at me and cherish me? 
want to be with me, want to be attached to me. Do you know my weaknesses, my rebellions, the times I, I know what I ought to do, my, my weariness in doing well, my low standards sometimes, my apathy, the fact that I could hear of this love but then also not respond to it as well. It should move me. This song is called the Song of Songs, kind of like the King of Kings or the Holy of Holies, right? The greatest song of songs. And I think there's an apt description of it. This song is of the effusive, just abundant, affectionate, outpouring love of God for his people. But sometimes we doubt it, right? And there's even doubts here in the Song of Songs. In the very next chapter, in chapter 5, we have something that some, some, some commentators think that, it's, that the bride is, 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 is having a dream. There's a couple of, of different passages where there, it seems like she may be entering into like kind of a, a dream state where she is describing something that, that didn't happen but, but seems very real. And I, I do think that might be an accurate description. She says in chapter 5, I slept but my heart was awake. A sound, my beloved is knocking. And he says to her, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is wet with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. He's been out and he's coming back to to where she is. And she's knocking on the door and saying, you know, open the door for me. And she says, oh, I, I put off my garment. How could I put it on? I had bathed my feet. How could I soil them? My beloved put his hand to the latch and my heart was thrilled within me. I arose to open to my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers would li- with liquid myrrh on the handles of the belt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. My soul failed me when he spoke. I sought him, but found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. The watchmen found me as they went about in the city. They beat me. They bruised me. They took away my veil, those watchmen of the wall. Do we not sometimes think Jesus has, the Holy Spirit is drawing me to him. He's, he's calling to me to fellowship with the Lord, to spend time with him, to... To, to be thrilled with the Lord, and I respond, eh, eh, not right now. I don't know. There's a game on. My kids, I, I need to cook dinner. My kids are calling. There's a lot of other things. I don't know. This, we're going to go watch a movie. That's more delightful right now. And then apprehension starts setting in. Then we fear, oh, no, you But I know I ought to commune with you, Lord. I know that you have come to me. You want to be, uh, to know me and for me to know you and for me to be filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. But I've I've missed this opportunity. I haven't responded well to your calling, to your invitation, to your appeals to me. And now I fear, right? Am I the only one that's experienced this? This fear that I haven't responded well to the love of God and then will I have another opportunity or, or have I damaged the relationship or does the Lord, if I've done it too many times, will, will he come to the door again or, or will he utterly reject me? These are fears that, that I think are common to Christians, common to people of faith, that, that our faith wavers. Turn to chapter 6. And here, here's the part, okay? In chapter 6, the groom speaks again to his bride, and he says to her, You are beautiful as Tirza, my love. Lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Turn away your eyes from me, for they overwhelm me. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes that have come up from the washing. All of them bear twins, not one among them has lost its young. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. 
It's nearly identical words to what he said in chapter 4, right? Don't let that be lost on you. She fears that her love, that she has not responded well to her love and that he's gone. He's left. And he returns and says nearly the exact same thing to her. Saints of God, the love of God is not going to depart from you with one failure, with one lack of response to him. He knows. He knows our weaknesses. He knows that we are but of dust. He knows that we even rebel against him, that sometimes we reject his guidance, that we reject his, his appeals to us to come and to find him altogether lovely. And yet he comes back and says the same exact thing. You are my beloved. Oh, the goodness of God, the love of God. The like of God. He is drawn to you, saints. I pray that your fears would be assuaged and mine as well. I want to get personal with you. I guess I've been personal already, but I was sitting out there on the other side of that glass one Sunday talking about some of these things with Pastor Stan. And we were having a conversation about the goodness of God. I told him, I said, you know, I, it's probably, I don't know, probably about three years ago, maybe, two years ago. And I told him, I said, I, I don't doubt that God loves me. I don't doubt the love of God. I don't doubt that he's good, that he's committed to you, that he will keep his promises, that he's powerful to save, that he's gifted us, that he's given me gifts for my good, for his service. I don't doubt the love of God that he's put together this body. He's put together a whole community around us that he's given us fellowship one with another and friendship and companionship and that every good thing comes from his hand. I don't, I don't doubt those things. But I got to be honest with you, sometimes, you know, as I've said before, I wonder, does he like me? Right. Does he want me around? And, and I'll gladly receive the benefits of God But it really is a downside, again, like I said in the beginning, to know, hey, there is somebody committed to me. But there's this gnawing doubt in the back of my head that for eternity, I will be merely tolerated. Maybe I'm overthinking it. (laughs) If this is a, a doubt that you've had. If not, then just know, but that is not the case. That the Lord has described his, his great love for his people, both corporately and individually, his great, great love for you. When the Lord chose Israel, in Ezekiel 16, it's described in marital language. Right? That his, his, his child was born and then later when, at the, when she was mature and, and ready f- at the time of, of marriage that he spread his cloth over her and brought her into him and that she became a wife to him. So that Israel was a wife to God. And in the book of Deuteronomy, when he's telling Moses or telling the people of his choice of Israel, out of all the nations, he says... In Deuteronomy 6, rather than 7, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that it, I'm sorry, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all peoples, but that the Lord, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. Now I know I said, I want to be careful to to highlight that the love of God is not merely oath-keeping. It's not merely oath-keeping, but it certainly contains promise-keeping. And having affection without commitment is also terrible. Having commitment without affection, that's also not enjoyable, not delightful. And yet we have here, God says, I don't know if you caught it in verse 7, he says, the, the question is, why does God love Israel? 
And the answer was, he set his love on you because he loves you. He loves you because he loves you. And he's committed himself to you. Now that word for love is a word that's full of desire. It's a, it's a very affectionate, attractive word. It also has another kind of odd usage in the Old Testament. I'll read one other verse and we'll, as Pastor Stan says, we'll come in for a landing. In Exodus 27, 17, the Lord says, he's giving instructions for the construction of the tabernacle. And he says, all the, in verse 17, all the pillars around the court shall be filleted with silver, filleted with silver. Their hooks shall be of silver and their bases of bronze. And in other passages, he describes the construction of the tabernacle, and he says there are these pillars and the curtains and these hooks. The word that's used in Deuteronomy 7 to say the Lord loves you because he loves you is the same word for the hooks of the tabernacle. The Lord is affectionately hooked to you. He's clasped to you. And not merely just as, as, as ball and chain. He's clasped to you in affection. If you're ever wondering, does God want me? He, he wants you so much that he's clasped to you. That the word he uses to describe his great love for you is, is as a hook. We are connected. We are bonded to one another. He wants you. Crown and joy. He wants you as a church, and he wants you as individual people. He sees us corporately, and he sees each and every one of you. This is great encouragement to me, I, genuinely. I, I'm okay sometimes with just, hey, look, grin and bear it. Jesus is not grinning and bearing it for all eternity. The lover of my soul wants to be with me. And he wants to be with you. If there's anybody here today that has not yet professed faith in Jesus, I just invite, implore you, respond to this appeal of love. This can be true of you by faith in Jesus Christ. He is calling to you. Come to me. He is good loving and kind and committed and generous and merciful and gracious. You will not find someone who merely tolerates you. Right. The Lord Jesus Christ is filled with affectionate love for you. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Oh Lord God, what love is this? What kind of love is this? We thank you so much that you've given the gift of marriage. The, the delight of, of, of union between man and woman. And we thank you, Lord God, that in your great mercy, even that is just a picture of the reality of what it's like to be joined together to you for all of eternity. We thank you so much, O oh God, that you've demonstrated this great love for us in the giving of your Son, and that he constantly is calling to us, wooing us, demonstrating his affection for us, and we pray, O oh God, that you would mold and transform your church, that we would respond to this great love, that we in like kind would be attracted to him, that we would be like the bride who is so drawn to her groom. Thank you, O oh God, for the hope of eternity that we have to be with you, that the holy city is pure and spotless, that nothing that defiles it will enter in, and that the thought that you could look upon us and say, there is no flaw, it's true. One day, eternally with you, there is no flaw, that we will radiate the, the very glory of God. Thank you, O oh God, for these great gifts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.